the topic uh, for today is letters of credit and bank guarantees and the legal principles governing uh, injunctions. By injunctions, I mean uh, the temporary injunctions uh, and uh, why this topic has been chosen for this session is that it is expected that with this commercial establishment of the commercial courts, uh, a lot of, a large chunk of cases pertaining to letters of credit and uh, bank guarantees would be before the commercial courts for adjudications. Uh, beginning with the, the LC, the letter of credit, uh, let's start on with the definition itself. What's a documentary credit? What's a letter of credit? I believe uh, many of you may have a fair idea of what, what a letter of credit is. You have been handling cases, but it's always better to have a deeper understanding of these financial instruments as a better understanding may lead to better decisions in the future. Now, a documentary credit is, as I was saying, a financial contract. It is issued by an importer's bank and it guarantees that uh, an exporter will be paid once the conditions of the letter of credit have been met. Now, we are lucky to have a brilliant judgment of the Supreme Court recently in which they, they defined a letter of credit, they provided the scope of a letter of credit, they, in fact, discussed the legal mechanism involved in a letter of credit transaction, the dynamics that, that are involved in an international sales transaction. It is this uh, case by the title of Sasco versus Askari Commercial Bank. Now, it is reported as 2021 SCMR 558, and I would uh, recommend that if you get time, you do read this, uh, this judgment. Uh, it's a great judgment in terms of what a letter of credit is and uh, how t at times an element of fraud is involved in a letter of credit and what, how the courts have to handle those particular cases. Uh, I'll touch upon uh, Sasco versus Askil Commercial Bank again in the later part of this judgment, but let's move on to the, the mechanism of a letter of credit. As you see, letter of credit transaction arises, in fact, originally from an underlying contract the underlying con or a primary contract. It is between a buyer and a seller. Now, because letter of credit are usually uh, used in international transactions, so this buyer would be the importer and uh, the seller would be the exporter. They enter into a sales contract and this sales contract basically uh, is the one, the transaction which leads them to follow a course where they can reduce the risk, the exporter can reduce the risk of getting payment under letter of credit and the buyer can reduce the risk of getting the delivery of the goods which are uh, specified for the purposes of the transaction. Now, it works in a manner that the buyer or the importer would move an LC application before its own bank which would be the issuing bank and the issuing bank would then inform, uh, issue a letter of credit that letter of credit would be, that credit would be reported to a nominated bank, would, which would be the bank which has to make, make payment to the seller or the exporter. Now this credit, once it has been informed to the exporter that it is available, so the exporter under the transaction, it uh, delivers the goods to the, the shipper or the carrier, the carrier means the ship itself. Uh, so once the goods have been delivered to the carrier, the carrier in re return provides him or the company with uh, the title documents of the, the shipping documents which we call, which includes bills, bill of lading and other documents. So once those bill of lading or other documents are received by the exporter, that exporter returns those, those documents to the nominated bank and the nominated bank informs the issuing bank that the documents are there. The documents are checked by these banks and if they are not discrepant, means if they comply with the terms of the letter of credit, the payment is made to the exporter. And besides that, because these documents have then to be returned to the buyer uh, for the purposes of so that once the, once the goods have reached his country, uh, it can be submitted to the, the carrier and the carrier would release the goods to the uh, importer. So this is how the whole transaction works and this flow charts uh, is basically a schematic representation of uh, this mechanism. Now you would appreciate that there are two different contracts. There is one contract which is a sales contract between the importer and the exporter. Now, now we have to remember that it is an independent contract. It's a separate contract. 
the other contract flows around the whole mechanism wherein the goods are being and the documents and the payments are being made that's another contract so the, we have to appreciate this thing that there are two different contracts in the whole LC, LC transaction and they work separately and independently now what are the different types of LCs the different types of LCs are irrevocable and revocable the irrevocable LC is one which cannot be changed bilaterally or unilaterally by uh, any of the parties however revocable LCs have become obsolete with the passage of time they are no more uh, in vogue then there are diff uh, by nature the LCs can be of uh, import nature export nature or in even inland LCs by import nature it's basically a perspective for uh, an importer it's an import LC for an exporter it is an export LC and by inland LC I mean LCs uh, which at times LCs are also used for inland inland transactions within the same state or country uh, then by nature there can also be a confirmed LC or an unconfirmed LC now what is a confirmed LC at times there is a confirmation note uh, in an LC that a confirming bank actually further guarantees it's not an issuing bank it guarantees that it would make the payment if the documents are not discrepant uh, that that would be called a confirmed uh, LC otherwise all LCs are usually unconfirmed LCs now by nature by view of time perspective of time again there are two types of LCs there are LCs which are site LCs then LCs which are usance or deferred LCs. Now by site LC I mean it's just like a bill of exchange that whenever a bill of exchange or an LC is presented the payment has to be made. And a usance or a deferred LC is one in which payment even if the goods have been delivered the payment can be delayed it can be made subsequently after a passage of time. These are important concepts which you may be, will be countering when an LC case will be before you as a commercial code. Now what are different terms of LC? Uh, the different terms of LC are by its form which I've already mentioned then uh, in, in an LC document itself then there there are a number of terms such as the number of LC it's a specific number number which is assigned then we have the applicable rules means the rules under which the LC would govern which I'll come to later in one of my slides and then the place and expiry of the LC the applicant the beneficiary who is the exporter the currency in which the LC is going to work the draft uh, was it, is it, by draft I mean the bill of exchange itself uh, it can be at site or usance which I have already mentioned. It can be a partial or a transshipment based LC. The port of loading is described, the port of discharge is described, uh, and date of issue, the beneficiary's name, period of presentation. This is a, these are all important terms of an LC. And they are specifically mentioned in the LC so that later on there is no discrepancy or conflict between the parties. Now what are the different shipping documents which I mentioned in the, the flow chart which I showed? Uh, these are performa invoice on the basis of which LC is uh, basically issued. Then there is a commercial invoice. There is not much difference between the two. Uh, this, uh, the performa invoice is actually used in the beginning for the purpose of issuance of LC itself. Uh, then there is a bill of lading. It is a very important document. Bill of lading is actually a receipt of the goods as well by the shipper, uh, by the carrier as well as it is a title document to the goods. Uh, and it is a document which has to be provided by the importer to the carrier so that the goods can be released to him uh, once they have been imported in that country. Then there are documents like packing list, certification, certificate of origin, insurance certificate, bill of exchange which I mentioned is also known as draft. The communication in LC matters between banks they usually take, uh, take place by messages and these messages are the SWIFT messages. The full form of SWIFT is, is basically it's a society for worldwide uh, interbank financial tele, uh, telecommunications. So these are the codes basically which they use and by which the banks infer how NC is being covered and what discrepancies they have to remove within the documents. Now the, I just mentioned about the rules, the, what, under what rules uh, the LC is governed. LC is governed under international rules. Uh, these rules are frame, have been framed by the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's in uh, the headquarters is in Paris, and uh, the purpose of these rules has been that there shouldn't be a disparity between different countries because in international trade, if one country has different set of rules pertaining to payments under LCs and another country has different set of rules, definitely there can be a conflict. To avoid that conflict, in 1920s, 1930s, the International Chamber of Commerce came up with this Uniform Customs and Practice for Documentary Credits Rules, which we call as UCP, and the present version of UCP last year revised in 2007 is the UCP 600. So when we have to see whether the LC uh, is compliant, the, uh, what, under what rules the LC, under what law the LC is being governed in terms of 
a global transactions, it is the UCP 600 and that is very much relevant for the courts as well when deciding cases. Uh, all proof of shipping documents and uh, is all there how it's to be proved uh, when it comes to UCP 600. But do remember that UCP 600 is only applicable to ir irrevocable LCs and that is what I told you earlier. It is the irrevocable LC which is in vogue. Uh, the other one has become revocable one has become obsolete. Now this is one of the most important slides uh, in my presentation. If the, uh, you may focus on this slide. It may help you while deciding uh, your cases in commercial court if they pertain to LCs. My love. My. The limit. Yes, the limit is there. The limit is there. Uh, the amount is there. Actually, it's not the limit. It's actually the specific uh, figure uh, which is to be mentioned. Means, for example, what's the the figure of the quantity which is being exported as goods? What is the figure of the value of the goods that is taken from the the commercial or the performer invoice itself? That is mentioned. That is mentioned. Everything is mentioned in the in the LC. And in my terms, I mentioned that the value of the goods and uh, the, the quantity of the goods and the value of the the goods has to be specifically mentioned. And the goods should comply with the same. There can be an error. Uh, a UCP system that does provide a margin of error of plus 5% or minus 5%, but not more than that. Yes. Yes, I'll, I'll come to that. That is on in the later part of uh, my presentation. These are basically, yes, this is a rele uh, very relevant question. And this will come when I'll be discussing the, the cases itself. Uh, what cases have, uh, what jurisprudence has been developed and the cases which have uh, been decided by the, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court. So the first principle, but I do, I'll do remember your question when I'll answer to that at that time. Uh, first principle which is very important pertaining to LCs is the autonomy principle or the independence principle. This has particularly, mention, particularly mentioned in the SASCO judgment uh, of the Supreme Court. Uh, and there are certain principles which you have to remember definitely as a, as a judge of the commercial court. Because without that, it may, you may not really appreciate the case of the parties. Firstly, that banks have nothing to do with the underlying contract uh, between the buyer and seller. As I told you, there are two different contracts. The sales contract between the parties is a separate independent contract. And the LC contract or LC transaction is something different. You cannot mix these two up. So, and you have to remember that banks have to encash the LCs. Banks uh, have nothing to do with what the sales contract is. Banks have again nothing to do with what the dispute between the two parties is. There may be a dispute between the parties. As you just mentioned, that the goods are of inferior quality. Perhaps the goods that were in, uh, exported and have been imported into the country are later checked on by the importer and he finds that they are of inferior quality or they do not comply with the, uh, the specifications which were mentioned in the, the commercial invoice or the LC itself. But the remedies are different. Still the banks have to encash that LC. There are certain ex exceptions but there are those exceptions are only in extreme circumstances which I will specifically point out in my, in my presentation. So any dispute between the parties, it is irrelevant for the purpose of LC. The autonomy or the independence of an LC has to be maintained. The banks are bound to honor the LC if the LC documents are being presented and they are compliant with what were required under the LC. The banks are bound, means there is no exception to that. The bank's obligation is defined by the terms of the LC itself. It has nothing to do with whether the goods are not in accordance, whether the documents are, are uh, huh, yes, there is an exception of false documents will come, which I'll come to later. But uh, as far as the, if the documents are complying with the terms of LC itself, the bank has to honor that LC and the payment has to be made to the beneficiary or the exporter. Uh, then there is another principle which is a, the, the doctrine of strict compliance. Now again, it's a very important principle because we have to remember that banks deal with documents and not with goods. Banks have nothing to do with goods. I mean, again, the same question I'm responding. Banks would not deal with the goods. It is for them the courts uh, in subsequent proceedings or the, the parties later on when it will be decided that they may see that, that thing, but not at the time of grant of temporary injunctions. So because banks deal with documents, so if the documents comply with the LC, the banks would encash that LC in favor of the beneficiary. The banks would not stop the payment. Banks are not obliged to make payments only if, if they are not complying with the, the terms of the LC. Means if not, the, the legal term we use in UCP 600 is the complying presentation. 
and if it is not a complying presentation means if lc says something but the document says something else then it has a right to refuse otherwise it has no right to refuse the encashment of the lc in favor of the uh, beneficiary yes there are clauses yes they they would be adjudicated by the courts but but how i'll uh, i'll come to that later well, i am uh, presently i am focusing on uh, the temporary injunction porter says that i imported these goods the payment has yet to be made i have already asked the bank to stop the payment but the goods are of inferior quality or they are not of the quality which was agreed by us uh, in terms of our invoice at that time the court cannot grant a temporary injunction there are only certain exceptional circumstances in which it can grant and they are very few uh, otherwise it cannot grant the the matter would be adjudicated later on in trial through evidence yes it would be adjudicated whether at that time the court won't be seeing not just the lc transaction but the main sales contract whether the sales contract has been breached by the exporter that what the court has to see at that stage even th even then the burden would be upon the importer if there has been a fraud or if they the specifications have not been met by the exporter while uh, exporting the goods to the country so what are the different nature of cases that uh, uh, the the courts uh, are expected to adjudicate the commercial courts particularly uh, by the beneficiary or the exporter the, those would be the cases pertaining to payments against lc for example it let's say some importer comes and he gets the payment stopped under the lc uh, from the bank so the courts would see uh, the the exporter the exporter would approach the court commercial court and would say that my payment has not been paid so the it would be so the, uh, an injunction may be passed or a direction may be given to the the importer to make the payment or the bank to make the payment because it's under the terms of lc so that are the cases which we expect from the exporter or the beneficiary from the buyer or the importer side we expect cases uh, that may lead to breach of contract which we just mentioned where the goods uh, are of the quality which are not uh, of an inferior quality or there is a breach of contract they not, do not comply with the terms of the contract yes the buyer uh, can ca approach the court and he can get a relief from uh, the commercial court this what nature of suits we expect we expect suits relief pertaining to relief such as permanent injunction damages specific performance declaration and uh, li and li of like nature now the focus because of this presentation has been applications for restraining encashment of lcs through temporary injunctions because it's a very hot topic and uh, the things have to be decided uh, off and on by the courts uh, and they are very material at that stage so i'll be focusing on those particular cases but there's an there's another exception that at times the courts can uh, there's a confusion that perhaps all lc cases can be brought to, uh, before the commercial court no that's not the case at times there are cases pertaining to an lc that is between the 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 buyer or the importer and his bank means the issuing bank and that is pertaining to the finance facility because the issuing bank issues a letter of guarantee for a consideration what's the consideration it provides provides the finance to the the buyer Uh, for, and for that it issues an lc in favor of the exporter and in return the buyer has to uh, pay um, uh, return the finance uh, by way of markup or interest so uh, this transaction is not cannot be governed by or doesn't come within the jurisdiction of the commercial court they are the banking courts uh, established for this purpose there are special courts under the financial institutions recovery of finances ordinance 2001 and it would be those courts would have would, which would have jurisdiction when the case is pertain to the buyer and his bank so a beneficiary cannot jump in that case he cannot interfere this the beneficiary cannot approach the banking court to say that uh, are to, to ask for a relief against uh, a bank uh, for, so that the bank may in cash a in cash a payment in its favor under the letter of credit it cannot do so for that it would have to come before the commercial court the banking court would have no jurisdiction for that because banking court's jurisdiction is limited to the bank and its customer and the customer is only the buyer the beneficiary is not a customer of the bank yes finance finance matters when the bank has financed yes yes only in finance matters that is was an exception and there are judgments by the honorable 
uh, Lahore High Court as well as well as the Honorable Sindh High Court. And I've mentioned these judgments, Miam Ahmed Ahmed was HSBC case, and we have this Procter and Gamble case, which, which specifically uh, held that beneficiary of an LC cannot invoke banking jurisdiction of the court. Now, I'll also touch upon bank guarantees. Uh, why bank guarantees has been included with this topic? Otherwise, uh, LC itself is a is a comprehensive uh, subject. Is that because there are many similarities between a letter of credit and a bank guarantee, especially when it comes to the autonomy principle, the principle of independence. Means, in, even in a bank guarantee, you cannot see the main dispute between the parties. There may be a dispute between the parties, but it, if if it is an unconditional bank guarantee, the the bank has to make the payment when it whenever it is called for by the beneficiary. So th that what makes it similar to the to the letter of credit. So what's a, a bank guarantee? Again, it's a, it's a bank's commitment to honor uh, payment to the beneficiary. But what in which case in which there is a uh, is a failure in fulfillment of contractual obligations uh, by the other party uh, on whose basis it has issued the the bank guarantee. Now bank guarantee because it's a guarantee, it's definitely governed by Section 126 of the the Contract Act. And uh, where it is used, uh, it is mostly used in real estate matters, construction work, supply of goods. And you will be, fa be facing a lot of cases pertaining to bank guarantees as well uh, for the reason that uh, it's, it's something, it's a financial instrument which is often on use in almost all commercial transactions. Now, what are the salient features of guarantee? What are its contents? Again, the guarantee number is there. The name of the bank, beneficiary, contractor, or buyer is there. The amount is specifically mentioned. The purpose of guarantee, validity period, last date of lodging claim, or the conditions in which it is to be invoked. Usually, the guarantees which are issued these days are unconditional guarantees. However, a guarantee can be conditional too. So, what are the different types of bank guarantees? They can be, uh, bank guarantee itself is a, it's a generic term. I mean, there are different types of bank guarantees these days. We have performance guarantees uh, to secure the performance uh, by the contractor. Then we have mobilization advance guarantee when advance is given uh, in the beginning in a contract and an amount is given and that is guaranteed through this bank guarantee. Again, then there, is, uh, there are payment guarantees to secure the payment and then there are different payment guarantees when the payment is to be made and, uh, by, uh, by way of installments by the contractor and uh, it is to be, so the guarantee is also a deferred guarantee. Uh, Yes, yes, that, that can be an exception. That can be an exception, but it should be a convincing argument. It should, the, the, the court should be convinced and how the court, is, it should, shouldn't be a mere allegation. It's not just mere allegation, there should be adducing evidence, even at that stage, even before the trial. Yeah, there should be a prima facie. Yes, the court. Yes. The, Yes, the court can, can issue a temporary injunction. The court can stay the encashment of that guarantee. The, there are the two exceptions as well. I'll, I'll be coming to the other two exceptions as well. Uh, there's irretrievable justice and uh, special equities. Uh, but the exception of fraud has to be adduced and should be compelling, there should be compelling evidence. No doubt at a prima facie stage. It shouldn't be just that uh, by me relying on the affidavit or me relying, relying on the argument. The argument should be reasoned. And uh, uh, in my view, the, the order definitely should, should provide some reasoning, even at the point of ad interim injunction, that this is the reason that uh, an encashment needs to be restrained in that particular case. The court, the court takes care of this, uh, these things. The court, definitely the court would has to do justice. It won't let anyone suffer, but there are certain exceptions in the law, and it, the objective is, again, to ensure justice. So uh, there are judgments of the, of the Honorable Supreme Court, and I'll, I'll come to those judgments. Uh, they would uh, assist you in terms how to decide whether a particular case uh, is one in which the encashment has to be restrained or not. Uh, so the general rule, as we need to remember is that uh, in cases of even LC and uncond unconditional, I say unconditional bank guarantees, courts should be generally reluctant to grant any ad interim injunction or a temporary injunction. I mean, there is no need actually, until unless you really, I mean, there is, is a very strong case that from, uh, from the documents that yes, uh, encashment needs to be restrained here. And uh, there's a difference between LC and uh, uh, bank guarantee as well. The difference is that uh, the, in LC, whenever the conditions of the LC have, are met, the encashment has to be made by the bank. But in, in the bank guarantee, it, it is to be first claimed, the, the, uh, the person, the principal, 
or the beneficiary has to first claim it from the principal debtor uh, that uh, to make me the payment. But if the payment is not made, then it will approach the the bank. But the bank, whenever it will approach the bank, the bank will have to make the the payment. Can't refuse. Can't refuse unless certain exceptions arise, which I will mention. Yes, it cannot be refused. But if there is a fraud, which is on apparent from the face of record, yes, it can refuse. Uh, the, for the court, for the court, uh, first party, the burden would be on the first party. Yes, the burden would be upon that first part. No, 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 not for the benefit. Uh, until unless the first party has discharged the burden. Yeah, yes, it makes out a strong prima facie case in which, even if irre irreparable loss, there is an exception. Strong prima facie case in which the encashment needs to be restrained. Yes, yes. good. Exceptions, uh, I'm coming to the exceptions. Now it's again an important uh, part of my presentation here. Fraud, now I'm, I'm reiterating that it needs to be a clear fraud on the, uh, on the part of beneficiary. And again, the bank should have notice of that fraud. Even if the bank does not have a notice and the bank has in cash, there is no issue. The bank, that fraud needs to be bring into the notice of the bank, even before the court. You need to bring that, not, uh, that th thing in, uh, in the notice of the bank so that the bank is in the knowledge that if the guarantee has to be in cash, there is a fraud which has been informed by the, the party. But again, then bank is not uh, in, in, uh, in a position definitely to stop or the, the payment. It would be the court which can, seeing that particular exception or fraud, which can grant a restraining order, not the bank. Not the bank cannot refuse by itself because if it's an unconditional guarantee, it would be for the court to grant an interim injunction if it feels like it's, if the, that a case has been made out. Because and the principle. Court can still do it. Court can still do it because there are judgments. Even if they are not part and parcel, even if they are not part and parcel, the court can still uh, uh, invoke, uh, seeing from the circumstances of the case. It depends on circumstances. For example, like there is a there was a condition of COVID-19 in the last few months when there were a lot of bank guarantees which were to be uh, in, in cashed, and the courts could have on the on the, the the clause of force measure even if there was no clause could have done so because the the reason being that the co the courts itself many of them were not functioning the party they were there was uh, uh, even a notification of section 144 crpc by the government itself the parties could not come out the construction could not be made by many contractors so it made out a very good condition on the principle of special equities where a force measure could be invoked even if the clause was not there in the in the contract. But again, it depends on uh, time. In times of war, in times of internal conflict, uh, this uh, the the clause of uh, or the provision of force measure, even if there is no express clause uh, in the contract, can be invoked uh, in these circumstances. So the principle when it comes to fraud is the same principle that fraud vitiates the solemn of the proceedings. So that's why this exception has been created under the law. Uh, then there's another exception which is of irretrievable injury or injustice. This exception uh, pertains to matters, again, internal conflicts, wars, or where there's been a substantial performance of the contract. There are circumstances perhaps where 80% of the, the work has been done by a contractor. Only 20 means a substantial performance has been made, but only 20% is left. And uh, out of, just because of that 20%, there's a dispute between the parties, and one of the parties comes to the uh, uh, ask the bank to encash the whole guarantee, even which uh, includes comprises of the 80%. In those circumstances, irretrievable injury or injustice exception can be invoked uh, by the, the court. Now, uh, SASCO versus the State Commercial Bank, as I mentioned, I would be returning to this judgment. It's, it was an interesting judgment in which uh, uh, one of the parties, SASCO, it entered into a contract with uh, a, a, a party in UK, and the purpose was uh, for the import of uh, acrylic uh, acrylic goods, and uh, the bill of lading, which was issued, which was alleged by the, by Sasco, subsequently the bill of the Sasco actually did not deliver receive the delivery of those goods, uh, and uh, the bill of lading was uh, in fact uh, forged, which it alleged. Now the burden was upon Sasco to establish that 
the fraud had been committed which burden it failed to discharge during the proceedings during the recovery suit it filed against its bank so it's a, it's an important judgment again why because it discusses the rule of autonomy and uh, which is not absolute and there is an exception of fraud in it now coming to certain important cases of the the supreme court when it comes to uh, the encashment of uh, lcs one of the important cases in which we find lot of principles and this case is more than sufficient uh, when it comes to lot of principles which have been reiterated which have been discussed by the honorable supreme court i would recommend that you particularly read this uh, case harald textiles versus bank indosus belgium uh, now in this particular case harald textiles was a company which uh, entered into a contract with a belgian firm for the import of machinery however when the machinery was imported it was found of inferior quality in fact uh, harrel textiles uh, incurred losses uh, by use by using uh, that particular machinery so uh, harrel textiles filed a case uh, before the trial court uh, uh, and uh, it uh, prayed for a temporary injunction the trial court did uh, issue an injunction temporary injunction in which it uh, restrained uh, uh, the the respondents from or the defendants from uh, getting the payment under the guarantee uh but uh, subject to their they, they deposit uh, uh, they furnish a bank guarantee so this was challenged uh, by the defendants before the the high court the high court uh, dismissed uh, set aside the order of uh, the trial court that no injunction could have, no temporary injunction could have been issued the matter came before the honorable supreme court and the honorable supreme court held that again the same principles that it's a, it's a different obligation it's separately even if there is a dispute between the parties pertaining to inferior goods the lc could not have been uh, restrained so uh, it it particularly held that any dispute between the seller and purchaser is of extraneous nature in this particular case in fact uh, the beneficiary the, or the exporter had in fact uh, uh, there's be, there had been an holder in due course the bill of exchange have been transferred uh to another party so even that the supreme court held that even that particular lc would stand in even higher pedestal which could not be restrained uh by the court and it particularly mentioned that the only exceptional circumstances which uh, i have just also mentioned that there is there is a fraud clear fraud can uh, the court restrain uh, the uh, the particular lc but in this particular case there was no allegation of fraud there was just a dispute with the parties as to the the contract breached by the exporter now with regard to BG, uh, bank guarantee again there is a very important judgment by the honorable supreme court it is this uh, shipyard k demon uh, case uh, in which uh, uh, in fact it's again a very comprehensive judgment for the reason that it uh, mentions uh, luckily both bank guarantees as well as lcs it provides the nature and effect of both these it provides the ground for the temporary injunctions the theory of non interference by the courts in respect of uh, bank guarantees and letters of credit in fact uh, the the supreme court applied certain tests it, it gave a mechanism in fact to the the lower courts as well for the future that how to determine whether uh, the demand of uh, restraining a, a, a encashment of a guarantee uh, has to be tested on what on what uh, pedestal uh there were questions like uh, which the supreme court uh, put before itself whether the demand for enforcing the bank guarantees has been made strictly in accordance with the terms of the document in that particular case the answer was yes that yes the demand was rightly made by the beneficiary the second question which it put was whether there was an allegation of fraud against the beneficiary in that particular case there was no allegation of fraud so the court answered in no and the third question with which it put was whether there was any special equity arising out of a particular situation or a strong prima facie arguable case against the enforcement of bank guarantee uh, when it comes to those special equities the answer was again no so this on the basis of these questions the court then decided the case and it said that the bank guarantee needs to be uh, in cash there is no uh, no case is made out for restraining the encashment of that particular guarantee and again the same principles were laid down uh, by the honorable supreme court that it lies on the similar footing of an lc it's an independent contract and uh, that it has to be honored uh, because it's an independent contract the principle of autonomy and uh, the uh, it cannot be restrained uh, now there there have been other judgments too of the honorable supreme court like we have the national construction versus emanik bal authority case uh, it's pertaining to the same emanik uh, bal uh, in lahore in which uh, a contract was given to national construction company for the the construction of that emanik uh, uh, bal uh, 